so I'm Al Coppola, and I want to welcome you all to the first of what are going to be two satire panels here at John Jay's Literature and the Law Conference. Now, uh, the conference theme of the idea of justice opens up in very interesting ways when we think about satire. Uh, Professor Sen, in his keynote address last night, made a, a learned and elegant case for rejecting the social contract tradition of justice theory, which requires the articulation of an abstract a priori ideal of justice. Instead, he favors an approach that does not require us to agree to some perfect notion of justice in order to act, but rather one that confronts and redresses concrete examples of manifest injustice. And I think a lot of us are inclined to see the, the value of such an approach, but this left me and, I, and some others, I expect, with some nagging questions about praxis. How do you bring injustice to light and mobilize the concern, the disapprobation, and indeed the outrage required to get people to actually do something about it? Now, this is where satire might just come in. It's a mode of expression which has a long and vexed relationship with the pursuit or the neglect of justice. Uh, as I tell my students in Lit 219, a class I call The Word is Weapon, Satire from Horse to Hip Hop, a uh, good few of those students who are in this room with us, uh, whenever the laws fail to do its job, whenever society has proved too pig-headed to know what's good for it, writers have used satire to expose vice and ridicule folly, supposedly. I say supposedly because that's the conventional view of satire, which understands as fundamentally conservative moral activity, uh, what, uh, where the satirist attacks a clear example of folly or vice and, if only by implication, promotes an alternative moral norm. Yet this conventional view has come under sharp critique uh, by some of the critics here at this table, I might add. Um, I'm thinking of what uh, Dustin Griffin said in his 1994 study, Satire Critical Reintroduction, who cautioned us that satire is problematic it's open-ended, it's essayistic, it's ambiguous in its relationship to history, uncertain in its political effect, resistant to formal closure, more inclined to ask questions than provide answers, and ambivalent about the pleasures it offers. Some satire might serve clear moral ends, but much satire, I'd say a lot of the best satire, is far more ambiguous in its means and effects. So what really happens when writers heed the cankered muse? Is satire a genuinely ethical activity, or is it just a pretext for showing off one's wit? Who gets to write satire, and whose interest does it really serve? What kind of difference does satire make anyway? Does it discover or produce divisions? Can we say that anything good ever came out of witty, cutting speech? These are the questions I asked to suggest the range of problems and concerns that our panelists are going to bring to this topic, which we'll be thinking about through this, this panel and during the writer's roundtable, which is going to directly follow when we'll have a chance to hear from a remarkable roster of satirists working today. So let's begin. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speakers today, and I'm going to do so in the order of their talks. Um, Rachel Brownstein is a professor of English at Brooklyn College, and Carrie Hintz is an associate professor of English at Queens College. Uh, in addition to separately authoring numerous books on 18th century British literature and culture, Professors Hintz and Brownstein are co-teaching a seminar at the CUNY Graduate Center this semester on women satirists in the period, and their paper is entitled Charmed Circles, Women Writing Comedy and Satire in the Long 18th Century. Next is Paul McDowell, uh, Associate Professor of English at New York University, who is the author of The Women of Grub Street, Press, Politics, and Gender in the Literary London Marketplace, uh, published by Oxford in 1988, among many other works. Her talk today, which will focus on a fascinating 18th century satirist provocateur, is entitled Oratory Transactions, John Order Henley and His Critics. Next is Frederick Bogle, professor of English at Cornell University. Among his six books is The Difference Satire Makes, Rhetoric and Reading from Johnston to Byron. Cornell 2001, and his talk will be entitled, I Come to Counsel Learned in the Law, Satiric Justice, Legal Justice. And our fourth speaker will be Sophia McLennan, a professor of comparative literature, Spanish, and women's studies at Pennsylvania State University. Her talk today, The Satirical Art of Stephen Colbert, is drawn from a recently published critical study, America According to Colbert, Satire as Public Pedagogy, Palgrave 2011. So with that, let me say thank you for coming, and I'll turn things over to Carrie and Rachel. And there's a handout. 
Great. Well, you're um, receiving the handout. I'm going to make a couple of remarks about the class that inspires our presentation today, which is our seminar at the Grad Center called Charm Circles, Women Writing uh, Satire and Comedy in the 18th Century, in which we consider uh, women satirists as members or not of exclusive groups. Um, political parties, social classes, circles, and sovereign nations are examples of charm circles, inviting complicity and ganging up against outsiders and among the ways they organize themselves. And we've also been looking about, at um, questions of women understanding and being part of satirical in-jokes. Um, one of our governing questions is what happens when you include women into satire um, or when you write women into the satirical tradition. And we would posit very quickly three um, changes. The first thing is you have to think beyond the traditional vision of 18th century satire as verse satire. Um, and we've spent quite a bit of time looking at non-canonical forms and in particular restoration and early 18th century secret histories like those written by Afro Ben, which were basically scandalous, muckraking um, things. If, if you know the Murdoch scandal, that kind of um, literature only um, very much about eavesdropping the uh, scandals of the great. Um, we also found that women of the 18th century were very assertive in writing themselves into a tradition and that you're going to hear more about that from us today as we talk in particular about Jane Collier who was very actively uh, working in the Swiftian tradition and claiming it for herself. And finally, we find that when you include women in the satirical tradition, it only amplifies questions of power and justice that are already very much circulating in the, in the culture as women very uncertainly and, and sometimes with incredible force <laughs> navigate the public sphere and assert themselves within it. So, um, is this good? Um, since this course was conceived as a dialogue uh, with two teachers, uh, we began this course on women writing satires with a rather conventional poem, Alexander Pope's Epistle to, to a Lady, which is a poem, a long formal verse satire about women. And I read that poem many, many times, but it was just reading it in this new context that made the following lines, the ones on, uh, that are number one on your handout, absolutely jump out at me. Narcissa's, oh, it's a poem that goes through a lot of women, all of whom have classical names, and they're characterized as having different ruling passions and faults. And then he gets to Narcissa. A Narcissa's nature, tolerably mild, to make a wash would hardly stew a child, has even been proved to grant a lover's prayer and paid a tradesman once to make him stare uh, once. Uh, a wash is uh, something you put on your skin, complexion improver. And what leapt out at me was not that footnote, but the footnote that wasn't there that suggested to me that Pope was, in fact, uh, echoing Jonathan Swift in a modest proposal for preventing the children of poor people in Ireland from being a burden to their parents or country and making them beneficial to the public, in which Swift wrote, I have been assured by a very knowing American of my acquaintance in London that a young, healthy child, well nursed, is at a year old a most delicious, nourishing, and wholesome food whether stewed, as in Narcissa's nature, tolerably mild, to make a wash would hardly stew a child, whether stewed, roasted, baked, or boiled, and I make no doubt that it will equally serve in a fricassee or ragu. And that's the famous modest proposal in which Swift suggests that since we, the English, have pretty much destroyed the people of Ireland by taxing and impoverishing them. They might as well, we might as well eat their children. And that struck me as absolutely apropos for the theme of this conference because of our Amartya's, uh, Amartya Sen's emphasis on the idea of justice and especially on, on famine. So then we started looking through everything we read with that in mind and 
we found that women did not shy away from questions of human flesh. To that end, we move on to Jane Collier, who in her 1753, The Art of Ingeniously Tormenting, riffs on her um, contemporary Jonathan Swift's um, earlier book, Directions to Servants, where he mock instructs servants in all the different ways you can possibly behave and gum up the mechanisms of your workplace through your passive aggressive and sometimes aggressive aggressive behavior. Um, and she, she offers this. Um, and she's, she's acting as a, a very kind instructist here. If I could be so happy, my good pupils, by these my hearty endeavors, as to instruct you thoroughly in the ingenious art of plaguing and tormenting the mind, you will have also more power over the body than you are first aware of. You may take the Jew's forfeit of a pound of flesh without incurring the imputation of Barbary, which was cast on him for that diverting joke. He was a mere mongol at tormenting to think of cutting it off with a knife. No, your true delicate way is to waste it off by degrees. For has not every creditor by the pleasant assistant of, assistance of a prison the legal power of taking 10 or 20 pounds of Christian flesh in forbit of his bond? However, without such violent measures, you may have frequent opportunities by teasing and tormenting of getting out of your friends a Pretty good picking. But be careful daily to observe whether your patient continues in good health and is fat and well likened. If so, you may be almost certain that your whole labor is thrown away. As soon, therefore, as you perceive this to be the case, you must, to speak in the phrase of surgeons, when they hack and hew a human body, immediately choose another subject. So um, obviously, if... Um, the various weight loss companies were to get hold of this terrific um, strategy of just wasting away or wasting away your friends by being progressively more irritating. It could be a multi-million dollar business. Um, but we want to refer you to the picture at the end of the handout too, which is the frontispiece of Collier's Art of Ingeniously Tormenting, um, where you see a cat toying with its food before it deigns to eat it. And this is the Collier way. She's like slowly stroke away at people uh, until uh, they are absolutely vanquished um, through, through being incredibly irritating. Um, and she's, she's quite helpful in giving you actual suggestions. Tips for tormenting your friends. Um, the next uh, selection, number four on your handout, is uh, from one of Jane Austen's youthful stories, uh, the heroine of which is called Eliza. Uh, Eliza gets into all kinds of trouble, starting out by stealing a banknote from her adoptive parents. Uh, she goes to sea, she comes back, she gets locked up in a dungeon, and by the way, she marries and has children, and the children are uh, locked up with her. Um, so this is on the cannibal theme. Eliza uh, jumps out of, she jumps out of her prison cell. I think she throws the kids out first, and then she jumps out, and then she tries to get herself together. Uh, her wardrobe, she now saw a fatal necessity of selling, both for the preservation of her children and herself. With tears in her eyes, she parted with these last relics of her former glory, and with the money she got for them, bought other more useful, some play things for her boys, and a gold watch for herself. But scarcely was she provided with the above-mentioned necessaries than she began to find herself rather hungry and had reason to think by their biting off two of her fingers that her children were in much the same situation. And the footnote in uh, the Oxford edition points out that references to mothers eating their children are common enough, but not to children eating their mothers. I think we can all agree that cannibalism gets really bad when you start eating your own self. And Frances Burney um, is again riffing on Swift's directions to servants when she talks about her experience in her diaries as, um, she talks in her diaries about her experience as um, the uh, maid of the robes uh, for the queen and her frustrations at this role which was not taxing her intellect and was intensely boring and, and frustrating. Um, and she says, this is what it's, it's like to be a maid. 
You must not upon any account stir either hand or foot. If by chance a black pin runs into your head, you must not take it out. If the pain is very great, you must be sure to bear it without wincing. If it brings the tears into your eyes, you must not wipe them off. If the blood should gush from your head by means of the black pin, you must let it gush. If you are uneasy to think of making such a blurred experience, appearance, you must be uneasy, but you must say nothing about it. If, however, the agony is very great, you may privately bite the inside of your cheek or of your lips for a little relief, taking care, meanwhile, to do it so cautiously as to make no apparent dent outwardly. And obviously this question of extreme self-control and of social um, approbation and dealing with um, all these eyes on her. And with that precaution, if you even gnaw a piece out, it will not be minded. Only be sure either to swallow it or commit it to a corner of the inside of your mouth till they are gone, for you must not spit. So in the course, Charm Circles, which Carrie and I are teaching this semester, we're trying to show um, a tradition. That is, we're trying to show that even the farthest out women's writing has reference to the tradition of satire. And uh, the Swift's polite conversation seems to be in the back of young Jane Austen's mind when she describes a conversation at an extraordinary dinner party. Uh, Chloe, this is number six, Chloe says, I shall trouble Mr. Stanley for a little of the fried cow heel and onion, disgusting food. Uh, Lord F says, Sir Arthur, taste that tripe. I think you will not find it amiss. Lady H, uh, Sir Arthur never eats tripe. Tis too savory for him, you know, my lord. And Miss F says, take away the liver and crow and bring in the suet pudding. Now, these were not things that were served at the parsonage when Jane Austen was growing up. Um, that's not what you think of when you think of Jane Austen. Usually, people think of something more like what is in uh, number seven, which is an extract from the last novel she wrote, the novel that was published after her death, uh, Persuasion. And this is the famous moment that bothers a lot of people who think of Jane Austen as sweet. The reason I include it here is that because of its subject matter, which is taste, and because of its, uh, the object of its satire, which is somebody who has eaten so much that she's grown fat. And here it is, it's rather unsympathetic. Um, they were act they, that is to say, the heroine and her, uh, the lover that she has rejected, she had rejected before, who has come back, and um, with whom she is going to finally end up at the end, uh, the romantic end. They, that is Anne and her um, friend Wentworth, Captain Wentworth, they were actually on the same sofa, for Mrs. Musgrove had most readily made room for him. They were divided only by Mrs. Musgrove. It was no insignificant barrier, indeed. Mrs. Musgrove was of a comfortable, substantial size, infinitely more fitted by nature to express good cheer and good humor than tenderness and sentiment. And while the agitations of Anne's slender form and pensive face may be considered as very completely screened, Captain Wentworth should be allowed some credit for the self-command with which he attended to her large, fat, sighings over the destiny of a son whom alive nobody had cared for. I didn't prepare very well for this selection because I didn't tell you that Mrs. Musgrove is mourning her son Dick who died while he was on board Captain Wentworth's ship some years before and, of, and whom she seems to have forgotten except that Captain Wentworth's appearance has brought him to everybody's mind. Um, so there she is weeping for the death of poor Dick Musgrove, whom alive nobody had cared for. There shouldn't be a quotation mark. Uh, personal size and mental sorrow have certainly no necessary proportions, writes the narrator. A large, bulky figure has as good a right to be in deep affliction as the most graceful set of limbs in the world. 
But fair or not fair, there are unbecoming conjunctions which reason will patronize in vain, which taste cannot tolerate, which ridicule will seize. Our final quotation was chosen for a couple of reasons. Um, it's from Bernie's Evelina of 1778. Um, and it's a very clear example of a woman writing herself into a satirical tradition, in this case, uh, the misanthropic tradition of the human-animal uh, boundary through the monkey. Um, Rochester, of course, famously comparing people to monkeys. Um, and also, we've been just overwhelmed by the amount of animals and animal imagery we've been finding on our corset. Um, and, uh, this sort of way that people and animals are conflated and, and questions of the boundaries between them are uh, always uh, uh, sort of at the center. And also, this is a really clear example of a moment where the boundaries between the human and the animal body are being confused, as in cannibalism. Poor, so this is at the end of Evelina where um, they, it looks like it's going to be a happy ending and then suddenly a monkey is introduced into a drawing room which, and chaos ensues. Um, like a real monkey. Poor Mr. Lovell, too much intimidated to stand his ground, yet too much enraged to submit, turned hastily round and forgetful of consequences, vented his passion by giving a furious blow to the monkey. So you have to hit the monkey. <laughs> you can't just let it be. The creature darting forward sprung instantly upon him and clinging round his neck, fastened his teeth to one of his ears. Mr. Lovell was now a dreadful object. His face was besmeared with tears. The blood from his ear ran trickling down his clothes and he sunk upon the floor crying out, oh, I shall die, I shall die. Oh, I'm bit to death. And you have to look at the last uh, image on your handout uh, in which you can see the, the scene. It, there's Mr. Lovell on, on the right in the foreground, and that little head next to his, intimately next to his, is the monkey's head. And you can be sure of that because you can see the monkey's tail coming out from behind Mr. Lovell. And here are all these little faces. The monkeys know not much smaller than the rest of them, which sort of begins to suggest the human-animal continuum. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carrie and Rachel. Our next speaker will be Paul McDowell. I can stand because I've been sitting all morning. Uh, there is a handout. Everybody has that? Extra copies? Um, I'm going to be talking about the political and legal conditions for performing satire in the 18th century. And I am a historian, so I'm going to tell you a story. In 1711, glowing over the sales figures of his periodical, The Spectator, Joseph Addison enthused. It was said of Socrates that he brought philosophy down from the heavens to inhabit among men, and I shall be ambitious to have it said of me that I have brought philosophy out of libraries, schools, and colleges to dwell in clubs and assemblies, at tea tables, and in coffee houses. Like Addison, I'm concerned with the travels of philosophy or wisdom across the daunting distances of social rank, gender, and especially literacy. But whereas Mr. Spectator memorably described himself as a silent man who preferred to write himself out, I'm interested in a contemporary of Addison's who developed a new commercial venue for oral exchange while simultaneously exploiting print. 18th century Britain is known for the proliferation of print and the rise of new genres such as newspapers, periodicals, and novels. But as Addison's comments suggest, this period also saw the proliferation of new venues for oral exchange. The later 18th century would see a rage for public debating societies, so-called rational entertainments where men and sometimes women of limited formal education paid a small entrance fee to hear and share views on religion, politics, and society. Today I'll introduce an individual I see as centrally important to the institutionalization of these new venues for debate. 
an individual famous in his time, but now almost completely neglected by scholars. There's only, there was only one other person in the world who studies this figure, and he has uh, sadly passed away. This individual is John Orator Henley, a notorious preacher come entrepreneur who ran an oratory in the heart of working London from 1726 to 56. Henley was ordained as a minister of the Church of England, but he openly broke from the church to pursue a grand scheme of setting up a new kind of religious and educational institution in the metropolis. For three decades, he supported himself by means of this unique freelance operation and a host of coordinated publications. Taking advantage of the Toleration Act, a historic legislation that allowed the legal right of private worship to Protestant dissenters from the church, he registered the oratory as a place of worship, but critics claimed he or argued he'd taken advantage of the new laws protecting dissenters to license an entirely new kind of forum, one more aptly described as a temple of rebellion or farce house than a church. At a time when as much as half the population couldn't read, Henley vowed his universal academy would be solidly beneficial to the public, to every rank of mankind. He argued there was no real separation between religious and profane subjects. The oratory offered a program of sermons, lectures, conferences, and disputations on topics so diverse as to anticipate a modern university. Predictably, given the oratory's initial location above a meat market, Satirists depicted Henley as the bull beef orator, preaching to greasy butchers and to meat porters who rang peels of marrow bones and cleavers to their orator's praise. Today he's remembered as the butt of poet Alexander Pope, but despite Pope's brilliant satiric skewering of Henley in the Dunciad, he was no obscure dunce. He was a constant talking point in London for 30 years. It's significant he was satirized by most of the major English literary authors of his time. Novelist Henry Fielding featured him as Dr. Orator, a character in his play, The Author's Farce. Twenty years later, religious poet Christopher Smart took to the London stage in women's clothing, at once satirizing and imitating Henley's multimedia methods in his own satirical venue, The Old Woman's Oratory, or Henley in Petticoats, and his coordinated periodical, The Midwife, or Old Woman's Magazine. Henley's, belie Henley's beliefs would grow more and more heterodox. By the mid-1730s, he was openly challenging the credibility of scripture and the validity of any kind of Episcopal authority. This is very, very dangerous stuff in the 18th century. And holding pre-advertised debates on topics such as whether there was ever such a person as Jesus Christ in the world. Not surprisingly, the government and church worked hard to shut down the oratory. But Henley defended his right to political expression. He argued that the teaching of the church, that Christ, quote, left civil government as he found it, and that British subjects should do the same, was an ideological tactic to, quote, bite and bully the people, to cheat them into order. Henley's development from a clergyman into a religious, political, and social radical who ultimately came to reject all Episcopal authority deserves far more attention than I can give it here. But it's not so much his dangerous, blasphemous, treasonous, and licentious ideas, I believe, as the radically public, semi-institutionalized venue in which he articulated those ideas on a regular basis that alarmed his contemporaries. Henley took full advantage of the collapse of pre-publication censorship of, of printed materials in 1695. But to read his print publications without also reconstructing his oral career would be to misunderstand the nature and extent of his influence. 
It was Henley's institutional and media experiment and the coordinated program of oral performances and publications he developed to reach across social barriers of rank, sex, and literacy that made him a threat to the status quo in his own time and made him worth knowing about today. Forty years after his graduation, Henley described Cambridge as the college where I had the stupidity to be educated. His lifelong critique of what he called the usual academic education was fundamentally a critique of the Anglican Church. He critiqued the church for its failure to provide practical training to ministers. More dangerously, he lambasted it for mandating subscription to a system. In 1726, he resigned his position as a clergyman and opened the oratory. His experiment was so successful that three years later, he had to move to a larger venue. One satiric print labeled Oratory Chapel uh, depicts Henley's clerk standing beneath his pulpit with a club, ready to fend off overly excited aud auditors and participants in debates. Admission was by a tiered system of payment. Henley himself insisted that in comparison to Anglican ministers, he did more for sixpence than any of them for 600 pounds. Henley actively reached out to working people. At the same time, though, he defended the oratory to the elegant world. He insisted some of the greatest persons in church and state have been auditors at the oratory. He claimed that the great Enlightenment philosopher Voltaire visited the oratory and Lord Bolingbroke and Alexander Pope. Contemporary prints always show women in attendance. Henry recognized that the vast bulk of the population had neither the time nor the money for the, a university education. He stated that the goal of the oratory was to supply the want of a university or universal school in this capital for the equal benefit of all persons of all ranks, professions, circumstances, and capacities. As an oral instructor, he seems to have been undaunted by literacy levels. Nor was he intimidated by the view of many elite contemporaries that educating those born to poverty and the drudgeries of life, to quote philosopher Bernard Mandeville, was challenging God's divine design. Speech genres at the oratory included academical and theological lectures, sermons and orations, and disputations and conferences, and he called them those. Perhaps most remarkable was an unprecedented course of academical literature for the ladies. In the wake of the oratory, the growth of lecture programs such as these is evidence of a huge demand among men and women deprived of formal education, yet eager to expand their knowledge. As for participatory events such as conferences, Henley's goal of polite public disputation of controversial topics was not easily executed. He stated that the design of a conference is just their knowledge. As for participatory events such as conferences, Henley's goal of polite public disputation of controversial topics was not easily executed. He stated that the design of a conference is to search the truth of a single proposition by the mutual free communication of sentiments in an amicable manner, as far as the church and state have thought fit to allow the search of truth. But in 1728, Henley added a new feature to the oratory that would become its most popular offering. At events he called Chimes of the Times, he delivered satirical or oral commentaries on the weekly news. The government recognized that Henley's Chimes of the Times was a new form of political critique disguised as entertainment. When Henley came into conflict with the law, the grand jury of Middlesex noted Diversions under the title of Chimes of the Times, Round Delays, College Bobs, Madrigals, Operas, etc. 
The government accused Henley of using satire and burlesque to make base and malicious reflections upon the established churches of England and Scotland, upon the convocation and almost all orders and degrees of men, and upon particular persons by name, and even those of the highest rank. In February 1728, Henley was arrested. Eleven months later, he was tried at the court of King's Bench and discharged. Surviving correspondence between the Attorney General, the Secretary of State, and the Bishop of London shows that the oratory served as a test case for the act of toleration. The government was faced with the question, how much toleration was too much? The Bishop of London accused Henley of turning religious assemblies into theaters and stages to which people repair only for curiosity and amusement. But since the Toleration Act, there was no longer any clear law by which the oratory could be permanently shut down. The following year, Henley was in trouble with the law again. But this time, instead of arresting him, the government took the highly unusual step of printing the presentment of the jury against him in the public newspapers. The authorities appear to have decided that an easier way to shut down the oratory was to frighten off Henley's audience. They described the oratory as, quote, an offense to all serious Christians, an outrage upon civil society, and of dangerous consequence to the state. But the government's printing of the presentment in the public papers gave Henley a widely available text he could refer to and counter-interrogate to advance his cause. So what exactly were critics' main concerns about Henley? Why did the oratory cause such great alarm? All of Henley's critics were concerned by his collapsing of an ideological dividing line between sacred and profane spaces and topics. The grand jury noted that although the oratory was registered as a site of worship, Henley made use of the said room for purposes very different than those of religious worship, and has their discourse on subjects of burlesque and ridicule, and with such gestures as are practiced in the theaters. They don't say what those gestures are. <laughs> Henley's use of humor in religious matters was alternately horrifying, entertaining, or simply baffling to his contemporaries. To many, this seemed the equivalent of casting pearls before swine. To be sure, the third Earl of Shaftesbury had famously argued that humor could be a legitimate way of discovering religious truth. But Shaftesbury was an aristocrat, writing to a learned audience, and he was referring chiefly to written texts. Henley, by way of contrast, was putting his doctrine of burlesque teaching into public oral practice on a regular basis. Henley defended the use of satire in religion and politics. He lectured on the history and philosophy of ridicule from Democritus to Dean Swift, Jonathan Swift, and he published an oration on serious buffoons. He argued that to burlesque error, vice, and folly is part of my religious persuasion as a teacher in my place of worship. It is doing honor to religion. He pointed to distinguished predecessors who used humor as a teaching tool, and he argued that if speaking freely on matters of state be called seditious, it ought to be considered what sedition is. Henley had many imitators, important to historians of the Enlightenment. Debating societies would open throughout Britain, allowing persons of diverse backgrounds to air their views on religion, politics, and society, and develop their intellects, at least until 1795, when gover the English government suppressed most public assembly and free speech in response to the events in France, the French Revolution. Henley was a member of a few early societies, but when one oratory offshoot, the Philosophical Society, began advertising lectures of natural philosophy, natural religion, and rational Christianity, he accused them of plagiarism. 
The ph Philosophical Society's response is significant for historians of secularism. Distinguishing their venue from the oratory, they declared, we do not usurp the priest's office and authority, no devotion or worship being performed in this place. We only philosophize. I'm interested in the role played by ostensibly religious institutions, such as Henley's, in the formation of the secular public sphere we associate with modernity. In Britain, public debating societies were an outgrowth of new fora for dissenting worship. Henley's oration on serious buffoons is the manifesto of one serious buffoon whose commitments to satire, to justice, to oppositional political critique, and to forging a new kind of forum for debate make him a precursor to the political satirists who follow in his footsteps today. For Henley, serious buffoon was an honorary title and one he earned at a cost. Henley's satire mattered or so thought the Attorney General, the Bishop of London, and the working class men and women who paid sixpence to hear him. As a scholar committed to the microhistories of so-called ordinary people, a concept I don't really believe in, I hope to have persuaded at least some of you here today that we lose touch with the histories of our predecessors, such as John Orator Henley, at our cost. Thank you so much, Paula. Our next speaker is going to be Rick Bogle. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. The history of satire criticism has been interestingly shaped by two phenomena in particular. First, the attention paid by Aristotle, Dryden, Boileau, Pope, and others to generic linkages between satire and epic, low and high established the possibility of valuing what have come to be called mock forms, but also laid the groundwork for a generic model that would eventually transcend the system of rigid oppositions that simplifies satiric criticism to the present day. Second, the interdisciplinary character of modern satire criticism has advanced in unpredictable ways the questioning of binary oppositions that began with Aristotle's casual observation that Homer's margites bears the same relation to comedy that the Iliad and Odyssey do to tragedy. Whether making use of Freud, René Girard, Mary Douglas, Homi Baba, or modern immunology, theorists of satire have explored that literary mode from a variety of fresh perspectives. This paper will sketch the genealogy, genealogy of modern satire criticism, explore a few of its implications, and apply these to the problematic and foundation-questioning standoff between law and justice as defined and administered by the state and law and justice as exemplified by the satirist in Alexander Pope's imitations of, imitation of Horace's satire 2-1. If Aristotle ascribed two heroic poems and one satiric play to the same bard, John Dryden held the historic and the satiric to be subforms of the heroic. For Dryden, Boileau's satiric poem Le Lutrin is also an heroic poem. His subject is trivial, but his verse is noble. Here is the majesty of the heroic finely mixed with the venom of satire. Dryden's own literary works, such as MacFleckno and the Conquest of Granada, perform this generic commingling in startling and vertiginous ways, repeatedly trans transgressing the conventional boundary between elevated and low, the heroic and the satiric. In the next century, works like Curry Bathos or Pope's Dunciad continued this shadow tradition of mingling serious and satiric. As William Empson noted, the idea behind MacFleckno and the Dunciad is that there's an ominous mystery in the way the lowest and most absurd things make an exact parallel with the highest. The, thir the first striking modern development in satire criticism corresponded with the establishment of American new critical practice and combined formalist analysis with genre, genre theory. Critics in the 1950s, like Maynard Mack, Northrop Fry, Alvin Kernan, and Martin Price, argued for a fully autonomous and fictionalized conception of satire. Whoever the actual author, whatever the historical object of attack, satire was to be understood as an independent literary mode with its own specific conventions. Despite considerable historicist resistance, formalism inaugurated a striking series of explorations, not all of them formalist, that al allowed much of the complexity and richness of literary satire to emerge in the second half of the 20th century. Some of the best of that work was strongly interdisciplinary. Drawing on both psychoanalysis and ethology, 
Crenan, in the 70s, rejected the Freudian argument that wit and humor provide pleasure by requiring less energy than reason, thereby muting the inescapably aggressive component of jokes, satire, and the like. Instead, contends Crenan, wit and satire are high-level expressions of rationality that imitate a key feature of animal behavior, the inhibition of interspecific aggression, that is, aggression within a single species. Just as animals can express aggression and dominance in non-destructive ways by, say, charging, but then swerving or stopping short of attacking, so humans, rendered deadly by weapons after the rise of technology, can express aggression in non-lethal ways through satiric attack that only mimics actual destructiveness. Another source of interdisciplinary energy was anthropology. Robert Elliott, in 1960, published The Power of Satire, Magic, Ritual, Art. There, Elliott remarks that the formidable power traditionally ascribed to primitive satirist magicians, power to attack, to shame, to curse, even to destroy, makes of the satirist a morally and socially ambiguous figure. Defending traditional society at times, the satirist's practice may also be revolutionary in ways that society cannot possibly approve, and in ways that may not be clear even to the satirist. The satirist identified with the society and in conflict with that society's other may suddenly become the other of society itself, and thus in a position structurally indistinguishable from that of the satiric object. In his 1979 satiric inheritance, Rob Nader Stern, Michael Seidel revived the interest in anthropological perspectives, drawing on the work of René Girard and Mary Douglas, particularly Girard's violence in the sacred and Douglas's purity and danger. In Girard's notion of symmetrical or mimetic violence, a lost originating offense gives rise to a potentially infinite series of retaliations, and thus to a symmetrical or mimetic relation between opposing forces that closely mirror each other. While each side claims the moral high ground of retaliating against rather than originating violence, uh, think Hatfields and McCoys or Israel and Palestine, the receding of the original offense into invisibility means that such a claim is inescapably phantasmatic. Applying this model to the structure of satire produces a significant reorientation of perspective. Now the traditional alignment of the satirist with the reader and against the satiric object is replaced by a degree of identification or equivalence between satirist and object. Thus, the satiric rhetoric that Fry, Crenan, and others began to explore in the 50s acquires an additional function, to produce or establish the satiric difference that prior theories had taken to be a given feature of the satiric mode itself. There is now new danger and precariousness in the figure of the satirist and in the satirist's relation to both satiric object and audience. If in Girard's scheme, punisher and punished display a kind of equivalence, uh, symmetry, mimetic, doubling, for Douglas, in purity and danger, certain rituals aim precisely to internalize threatening and potentially chaotic forces. Most often, of course, pollution rituals seek to isolate and expel forces that threaten cultural rules, categories, and order. But in Douglas's view, such forces also hold the promise of cultural transformation and growth. So at times, they must be ritually internalized if their power is to be harnessed to invigorate a rigid system of cultural norms and categories. The Lele people of the Congo normally regard the pangolin, or scaly anteater, with horror because it symbolizes the pollution associated with cross-categorial contamination. It's scaly like a fish, yet climbs trees. It looks like a lizard, yet it suckles its young like a mammal, and so on. But at other times, this hybrid monster is ritually and reverently eaten by initiates and taken to be the most powerful source of fertility, an introjected power capable of transforming and revivifying the cultural schemata by which they customarily live. The implications for satire are multiple. If the satirist routinely and commonly attacks the satiric object as though it were a polluting figure, Douglas's analysis suggests that satirists may also need those objects. Not because, as is often said, the satirist would be out of work with something to attack, though that's true, but because satiric conventions and the very structure of social and cultural norms those conventions defend must accept the risk and danger that come from intimate association with abhorred objects if the conventions and norms are to remain vital as well as lucid. The satiric object is not only an opponent, it is also the satirist's secret sharer. Problematic relations between self and other also mark Homi Baba's suggestive 1984 essay on colonial mimicry, which explores the way the oppressive gaze of the colonizer is returned as the skeptical and disruptive gaze of the colonized. Baba argues that the colonizers demand that his behavior and values be mimicked by the colonized, be like me, produces unforeseen and potentially anarchic consequences. To the degree that the colonized performs the required mimicry of his oppressor, 
He also implies that the authority of the colonizer, precisely because it is imitable, may itself be an arbitrary, even histrionic construction. In consequence, the colonial hierarchy established on the basis of the distinction between original and copy is gradually made to disclose its arbitrariness and thus its groundlessness. The contemporary distinction between religions and cults expresses a similar contrast between foundational integrity and belated imitation. If some voters worry that Santorum is a Roman Catholic and thus susceptible to religious influence, others worry that Romney is a Mormon and thus not traditionally religious at all, perhaps a follower of a five million member sect of suspiciously recent origins. How does one distinguish between a religion and a cult? Is Zoroastrianism a tiny religion? Is Methodism or Christianity a huge cult? Should we fall back on the distinction between sanity and madness offered by Nathaniel Lee, the 17th century dramatist, who, when asked how he ended up in the madhouse, said, they said I was mad, and I said they were mad, and damn them, they outvoted me. <laughs> Colonizer and colonized, religion and cult, original and copy, authorization and arbitrariness, these issues converge on questions of law and justice in Pope's imitation of Horace's first satire of the second book a verse dialogue between the seemingly hapless poet and his well-connected lawyer friend. The poet begins by lamenting that readers find his satire too bold, or unflattering, or even weak, and he appeals to the friend for advice. The latter advises him to quit writing, to turn out court flattery, to stop making enemies, to fear for his, for his life, in short, to abandon both satire and principle and capitulate to the way of the world and the powers that be. In response, the poet slowly grows from a humble or faux humble suppliant to a crusader for virtue, bringing vice to light, unintimidated and untiring. And I quote, yes, while I live, no richer noble knave shall walk the world in credit to his grave. To virtue only and her friends a friend, the world beside may murmur or commend. In the course of the poem, moreover, the friend and the legal system he represents become drained of moral significance and authority dwindling to a simple compliance with power, interest, and social hierarchy. The poet, on the other hand, steps into this ethical vacuum and replaces both the lawyer friend and institutional law with the truth-telling satirist and the system of moral justice his virtuous satire represents, the bankrupt letter of the law versus its living spirit. That this is an agon not just between moral values but between rival conceptions of law and justice as well is clear from the language of the poem. Pope plays repeatedly on the word cause, which means both a principle or aim, the cause of affordable health care, say, and a legal case or lawsuit. By regularly rhyming cause with laws, he develops a contrast between laws that have only their legal status to support them and a cause that is both a legal proceeding and an expression of the moral virtue the satirist claims to serve. He writes of this virtue, and here are some of those rhymes I was talking about, can there be wanting to defend her cause, lights of the church, or guardians of the laws? A few lines later, he asserts that he will bring hidden vice and corruption to light, thus standing in for an eviscerated and feckless legal system. I will, or perish in the generous cause, hear this and tremble, you who escape the laws. Finally, near the poem's end, he utters a kind of brief courtroom summation. This is my plea, on this I rest my cause. What saith my counsel, learn it in the laws? That last phrase echoes one from the poem's beginning and we can now unpack an ambiguity that was not apparent at first reading. Throwing himself on his friend's advice early in the poem, Pope had said, Timorous by nature, of the rich in awe, I come to counsel, learned it in the law. A sentence whose syntax readily permits learned it in the law to describe either counsel, the friend, or Pope himself, I, I come to counsel, learned it in the law. This ambiguity, like the puns on cause, economically splits the poem's image of law and justice into two competing entities. The split takes a different form at the very end, when the friend and the satirist seem, but only seem, at last to agree. Against the friend's warning that laws are explained by men and can thus be twisted to prosecute upstart poets, Pope claims not to produce libels and satires at all, but grave epistles bringing vice to light, such as would be approved even by the first minister, Sir Robert. Ever attentive to a mention of power and place, the friend interrupts, Sir Robert, indeed, the case is altered, you may then proceed. In such a cause, the plaintiff will be hissed. My lords, the judge's lap, and you're dismissed. The word proceed, you may then proceed, has two pertinent meanings. The first is to initiate legal proceedings, suggesting that the friend now thinks Pope's case more promising. The second meaning goes further, since proceed also means to be admitted a barrister, a lawyer. 
It thus symbolically confers lawyerly status on the poet himself, acknowledging that he is indeed learned in the law. But since the law has been fully redefined by the friend as the will of the powerful, the seeming accord between lawyer and satirist actually papers over their utter distinctness. Law and justice as administered by society, and law and justice as expressed by the moral and truth-telling satirist, have exactly zero common ground. In light of Baba's argument about mimicry, one could say that the construction of the satiric counterpart to official law and justice exposes the constructiveness and arbitrariness of officialdom itself, depriving the latter of its mystified and Oz-like status. Think my cousin Vinny. This does not mean that official law should be replaced by satiric law, but it does redefine the coordination of law with morality and of legal judgments and decrees with justice as a perpetual problem rather than a fait accompli. And it suggests that a proper foundation is something that must inform and arise from a history of practice rather than something that precedes and guarantees practice. It is also symbolically important that the status of Pope's text is both referential and rhetorical. As a referential text, it designates people, things, and institutions in the actual historical world of 18th century England. As a rhetorical text, however, it creates its own King George, Sir Robert, Queen Carolyn, English law, even its poet speaker and the friend he addresses. These are produced by the text rather than producing the text. And it does so by purely linguistic means, by virtue of its rhetorical character. But this ambiguity, referential versus rhetorical, can in turn be applied to the actual institutions of law and justice, whether those of 18th century England as represented by the poem's lawyer interlocutor, or the institutions of law and justice anywhere and at any time. What it teaches us is that those institutions, though they pretend to be established and sustained, sustained by venerable principles and foundations existing from time immemorial, are also sustained by rhetoric which is inescapably a form of power. To that extent, institutional law and justice are no less constructions than Pope's poem itself. Thank you. Thank you very much to Al for organizing these panels. This has been a huge treat for me. Um, oh, I'm there. OK. Um, all right, so as Al mentioned, this is part of a book that I had just come out. So I have publicity and all sorts of uh, self-promotion things if you're interested afterwards. Um, it's always that uncomfortable thing that happens for us in uh, academia where we we sort of want you to read our work, but we don't really want to ask you to do it. All right, so my talk is called The Satirical Art of Stephen Colbert. Satire is a comedic form uniquely suited to provoke critical reflection. Its ability to underscore the absurdity, ignorance, and prejudice of commonly accepted behaviors by means of comedic critical reflection offers an especially potent form of public critique one that was much needed in the United States in the post 9-11 era. But can comedy really be that politically powerful? My argument is that Stephen Colbert's satire has been one of the, if not the, primary source of social critique in the United States since the launch of his show, The Colbert Report, in 2005. <clears throat> Against claims that would suggest that satire is merely negative criticism that at best encourages cynicism and at worst provokes political apathy and narcissistic diversion, my position is that Colbert has not only offered his fans ways to productively engage in contemporary politics, but that he's also redefined the parameters of political dissent. Colbert has done this by making satire a form of public pedagogy. When I refer to Colbert's satire as public pedagogy, I'm describing it as an educational force that takes place on a large public scale. Henry Giroux, the theorist who's developed the idea of public pedagogy has argued that education occurs more and more often outside of the space of the classroom. It's important to bear in mind that Colbert's program emerged in a moment when the reigning public pedagogy was especially repressive. Any questioning of the government's practices after 9-11 became virtually tantamount to treason. 
With hindsight, it's now relatively easy to see that during the period of 9-11-2001 to the election of Barack Obama in 2008, the public was given very little room within which to question the decisions to go to war in Iraq and Afghanistan, to pass legislation that radically reduced civil rights, and to practice torture and illegal detention. The public pedagogy of the news media in that period mainly reinforced the government's practices with few exceptions. This is why the work of Colbert and comedians like him was particularly important since via parody and satire, they were able to open a space for critical reflection and public questioning of the status quo. And even more importantly, they did this through the very same media force, cable television, that was itself the source of some of the worst forms of public pedagogy. Colbert's work is significant because it uses a wide-reaching media forum to foster public debate of major issues. And it does that in a way that energizes and amuses its audience. While much was made after 9-11 over the question of whether or not comedy was an appropriate response to the attacks, and over whether or not such comedy was un-American, those familiar with U.S. history know well, and comedy, I mean, in satire that obviously predates the United States, right, know well that political comedy, especially satire, has a long tradition in this country. Beginning with the Founding Fathers, satire and fake news were used to encourage the public to support the goals of the revolution. Colin Wells writes that during the revolutionary period, satire was, quote, the most popular and politically important literary form in American political life. Rather than think of Colbert's satire as an anti-American, treasonous practice that threatens the nation, my argument is that Colbert's comedy both participates in and furthers the legacy of US satire, and that it's especially invested in strengthening the nation's commitment to democracy. If democracy is at risk, if the public sphere has been undermined, and if corporate mentalities have overshadowed civic responsibility, then satire such as Colbert's has become one of the prime ways to challenge these developments, and its impact is not merely theoretical. A Pew Research Center for the People in the Press survey in 2004 found that 61% of people under the age of 30 got some of their political news from late night comedy shows. Their research shows that, quote, young people, by far the hardest to reach segment of the political news audience, are abandoning mainstream news sources of election news and increasingly citing alternative outlets, including comedy shows such as The Daily Show and Saturday Night Live, as their source for election news. In another Pew Research Center poll, Jon Stewart was ranked eighth on a list of most admired journalists. <laughs> with scores slightly below Brian Williams and Anderson Cooper, a fact that suggests that today's political satire does not just comment on the news, but is seen by many to be a source of it. When satire is combined with parody, as is the case with the Colbert Report or The Daily Show, the combination is especially powerful. Parody mocks or makes fun of an original. If satire aims at human folly, vices, and abuses, then parody packs an extra punch as the comedian embodies that which is being lampooned. When Colbert presents himself as a right-wing, bloviating political pundit who thinks with his gut and believes that his fears should be those of the nation, he adds an additional layer of critique to his satire. In Colbert's case, his parody of an O'Reilly-style punditry always overlays his remarks against the object of his parody. Such a technique teaches his viewers how to detach from the type of information that O'Reilly offers on his show. In the brief time I have today, I want to point to one of the particular features of the Colbert Rapport that reveals its satirical art and distinguishes it from other contemporary versions of political satire available on cable television. And that is the way that the show engages in wordplay. It's worth remembering the way that the post 9-11 period presented the US public with a crisis in language. The Bush administration presented one of the most extreme examples of linguistic manipulation at the service of acquiring power in US history. To cite merely a few of the most common tactics, the administration misrepresented, lied, obfuscated, named, renamed, refused to name, censored, and silenced. 
These practices emerged at a historical moment when the mass media was especially ill-equipped to provide the U.S. public with news reporting vital to the creation of a public sphere and a deliberative democracy. In addition, these challenges to meaningful representation of social issues coincided with the rise of postmodern theory, some versions of which suggested that there was no way to actually represent reality, that reality itself was an elusive and misleading concept obfuscated by layers and layers and layers of self-referential signs. Add to that the atmosphere of fear after 9-11, when journalists, professors, and other public figures were threatened if they dared to critique the government. Recall that also during this time, those who dared to ask questions about the way that the administration presented the public with information were often called traitors. For all of these reasons, this was an especially dire moment for the use of transparent language, for productive debate, and for reasoned, informed, and inferential de decision making. And while the election of Obama brought an end to the terror speak of the Bush era, the need to call attention to representational flaws in the public domain remains relevant and necessary. While the Obama era has given Colbert plenty of new material, it was the Bush era that created the satirical infrastructure for much of the show's comedy. Colbert explained in an interview with New, York, with New York Magazine that the role of language in the Bush administration inspired his own work. And this is the same quote that's on the slide, right? Quote, language has always been important in politics. This is an out of character interview he does, right? He says, but language is incredibly important to the present political struggle. Because if you can establish an atmosphere in which information doesn't mean anything, then there's no objective reality. The first show we did a year ago was our thesis statement. What you wish to be true is all that matters, regardless of the facts. Of course, at the time, we thought we were being farcical. <laughs> Colbert's point is that the way in which the public was given false notions of the truth was through deliberative, deliberate linguistic misrepresentation. A central goal of the show, then, is to highlight these practices and encourage the audience to think about them. But rather than offer a straightforward critique of language, Colbert uses a complex array of satirically funny wordplay techniques to point out the power of words as well as the ease with which they can be manipulated. While most viewers are aware of the artful way that Colbert plays with words on the word segment, my research suggests my research argues that each section of the show has a particular way of playing with words. For instance, the opening rundown of the highlights of the upcoming show is driven by the use of puns and malapropisms. Puns are a form of wordplay that points to a word's multiple meanings. This can happen through playing with homophones, it can take the form of exploiting multiple meanings of words, or it can happen when a familiar word is altered or substituted by a word that sounds similar. Examples of puns from the opening rundown include, quote, it's not a recession, it's a correction. Correction, it's a recession. This is the Colbert Report. Or, shave your head, strap yourself in, and throw the switch. You're about to get a truth accusation. <laughs> the next part of the show is a veritable linguistic smorgasbord as animation of an American eagle soars towards the viewer and a digital image of Colbert is surrounded by circling words. <laughs> the words that are used in this sequence vary, but here are some examples broken down into main categories. You can see that if you're a word geek, this is just too much fun, right? <laughs> of course, the most noteworthy and most entertaining part of the opening digitized sequence is the pun's neologisms, right? These words get at the heart of Colbert's signature wordplay, words like Lincolnish mega American, Phoenix rising, and factose intolerant encapsulate much of the satirical qualities of the Colbert character. They highlight his exaggerated patriotism, his truthiness, and his pundit-like desire to create a culture of fear for his viewers. Their silliness immediately reveals the irony of these terms, making them function satirically and not literally, creating a critical layer of meaning between the term and what it represents. Now the viewer is prepared for the next major form of wordplay, the word. <laughs> Clearly, this is part of the show that most apparently comments on language. But as I pointed out, two earlier features of the show provide an important linguistic context for the segment's language games. 
This segment is partially modeled on Bill O'Reilly's The Talking Points Mem Memo, and I'll confess that in doing this research, I had to watch a heck of a lot more O'Reilly than anyone really wants to watch, right? Um, so the Talking Points Memo happens when O'Reilly takes a position on a current issue. On the O'Reilly factor, viewers see a right sidebar text identical to O'Reilly's words. So Colbert's version is intentionally far more complex. As Colbert explained during an out-of-character interview with Terry Gross, the word segment is based on a, a single, is an essay based on a single word. And I'm, I'm reading the quote you have there. Uh, and it, here's, here's Colbert. He says, I'm speaking a completely self-sufficient standalone essay, hopefully comedic, and on the left side of the screen, it's giving bullet points that are excerpting parts of what I said or commenting on what I just said, and the bullet points end up being their own character. Sometimes they're reinforcing my argument, sometimes they're sort of countermanding my argument, but it's sort of a textual addition of jokes or satire to the verbal essay I'm doing at the moment. Jeffrey Baim has suggested that the bullet points function as a corrective to Colbert's spoken words, and I quote, he says, the written text provides an unspoken voice, a second level of meaning that often contradicts, challenges, and undermines these spoken words. But I would suggest that the bullet points don't offer a unified discursive position. Sometimes they further exaggerate what Colbert is saying, or they critically contradict him, or they just add a silly aside, or they express a sense of frustration and defeat with his use of rhetoric. The brilliance of the bullet points then is their very discursive registers because the bullet points are not simply one unified foil to Colbert. They don't merely create a single additional layer. Instead, they add many discursive layers. This form of deconstructing language within a critical and politically motivated project that hopes to reinfuse language with socially relevant meaning while also having fun offers viewers an extremely rich linguistic experience. Colbert demonstrates to viewers that satire's political critique is always aesthetic. It always depends on art as well as an appeal to reason. The word segment is an artful deconstruction, reconstruction, and construction of language that has come to symbolize Colbert's powerful use of language on his show. There are more excellent examples of words that have appeared on the segment than I have the space to highlight. Stand out, of course, is the word's first show, uh, first show's word, truthiness, right? Later, he highlighted clarity in reference to Rudy Giuliani's presidential candidacy. But there have been countless others. What's also important to note is that the segment has offered neologisms like wikiality and freem, which was a combination of freedom, like right, you have the freedom to be like me, as well as everyday words like silence and silly words like jack squat. In each of these cases, the segment has offered viewers an extremely complex linguistic interplay between Colbert and the bullet points that, rather than spoof feed ideas to the viewer, calls on them to produce their own active and engaged interpretation and analysis. This highly critical exchange between Colbert, the bullet points, and the viewer then prepares the stage for the show's next section, the interview. In order to understand the interview segment, it's worth remembering Colbert's statement to Terry Gross that the title of the show is an intentional pun on rapport, right? R-A-P-P-O-R-T, right? And here's the quote from the interview. Uh, he described a rapport as, quote, a sense of understanding between the speaker and the listener. We're the same people, you and me. We get it. The rest of the people out there, they don't understand the things that we understand. The show is like an invitation to the audience to be part of the club. What's interesting in light of that statement is that the interview is not a rapport, at least it, or at least it simulates the lack of it. When Colbert interviews someone on the right, he takes an uber right position and feigns rapport with his guest, which then makes the guest act like an idiot. When he has a left-leaning guest, he feigns contrariness. Because he's in character, the rapport is simulated, just as the contentious confrontation is a joke as well. Consequently, it's the performance of these sorts of false dialogues that creates the real hope of a rapport between Colbert and his viewers. Other ways that the show plays with words take place during the news parody segment that happens after the credits. 
Colbert relishes highlighting when pundits and politicians create false distinctions between words when they try to back away from inflammatory statements, such as when Glenn Beck accused Obama ha of having a deep-seated hatred of whites, but then said, quote, I didn't say Obama didn't like white people. This then led Colbert to conclude, quote, deep-seated hatred and dislike are two different things. They're as different as putting your foot in your mouth or your head up your ass. <laughs> Here we have another excellent example of a simple yet immensely effective way that Colbert can satirize the mass media through an artful use of language, simultaneously making us laugh and making us think critically. Again and again, from puns to malapropisms to neologisms to irony, parody, and farce, Colbert uses absurd language to expose absurd language. While he deconstructs the use of words, he always does this with an eye to be building meaningful rapport with his audience. In this way, Colbert's program is both playful and poignant, since it has become one of the primary spaces through which a mass public grapples with difficult questions. And like the influential satirists in whose footsteps he follows, Colbert's work has evolved in a moment of intense conflict. War, economic instability, rapacious free market practices, climate change, rampant racism, and a disaffected and distracted public that's not helped by the ratings-driven frivolousness of the news media. This has been an era when it has been incredibly difficult to get people to take things seriously and when there have never been more serious things to consider. Colbert's satire, though, has taken comedy seriously, giving it a significant impact on the way his viewers perceive the world.